All right, can, can you hear me? Perfect, perfect. So just a, probably a quick round of logist, post-lunch logistics. How many of you call, call yourselves a coder? Awesome. How many of you have done some formal computer science uh, education? How many of you have done a course maybe on compiler theory? Ah, the numbers are going down, so it's interesting. How many of you know what the abbreviation of CFG stands for? Yeah, OK, so I can, I can talk, and there will be new stuff for you, except for a couple of new people here. So all right, I, I could get into hacking the Python ASD directly, but let's have a bit of fun before that. And, and of course, I'll put some boring slides in between just to give the build up for the actual hack later on. Um, I am going to start my Python compiled Python shell, and as you can, can you all see the see the screen and the font is good. Should I maybe? Uh, I think this font should be good, right? Yeah, cool. So this, as you see, is uh, Python 3.7. I have just cloned the source directly from uh, the they now host on GitHub and just cloned it from GitHub. And I just want to verify that on my command line. And when I do import SYS, and it gives me a syntax error. What, what do we have here? How many of you think import sys is an absolutely valid line of Python code? Yeah. But what is happening here? Why is it telling? And this is an actual Python REPL, by the way. Why is it saying invalid syntax and just a little bit of uh, Time wasting here just to let you grab the uh, feel feel how awesome this is going to be. So now, <laughs> so what I've been doing is I've been learning Deutsch after coming to Germany. I'm originally from India, and uh, the, one of the uh, one of the common ways that people tell me to learn Deutsch is to sort of have an immersive experience to fill myself with Deutsch everywhere. So, <laughs> so I've written something called Ein Fuhr. <laughs> And of course it works, because I've hacked into the Python score score, and now I can do things like sys.version info, blah, 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 and it works. Of course, this is not enough for me. I want to take it to a completely new level. And I want to try everything. Python should be German for me right now. So <laughs> um, did not work. Of course, I was playing with the fire there. Version info dot major. Now I know why it did not work because version info is a tuple, and major is an attribute inside the tuple, and I think it is a name tuple. And this should work. Of course, it works. I do know my Python. All right. <laughs> cool. How many of you think this cannot be done at all? And I've. Okay. How many of you have an idea of how this could be done? Oh, cool. A lot of you, but I thought none of you. But yeah, OK, we will get to how we can do that later. So now to the boring slides, just the just brief boring slides before actually doing more things with this. Right, so firstly on hacking. Hacking is not something something, something only uh, all, all the cool kids do or, all some, or you need some kind of formal education for it. Breaking down things is hacking. So you have a system. Do not treat it as a black box. Break it down, see what the pieces are, try to do something with it, and that's hacking. And hacking is fun. So the idea of it is I would, be, I would love to hack all of Python, starting with its ASTs, grammar, uh, the opcode, the bytecode, and all the other various parts of Python. But we don't have time to hack everything, so I will just give you a flavor of hacking the various other parts, but we will hack the abstract syntax trees. What is an abstract syntax tree? So an abstract syntax tree is just an intermediate representation of something. We will come to that later. 
and now we'll come to that, a data structure <laughs> to represent source code. All right, so an abstract syntax tree is just a tree, like a normal binary tree or a binary search tree. It's just a fancy name for a tree. And in the compilation process, it, is, it lies somewhere in between. So we are treating code as data structure. So you'll have, you'll have a Python file or a source file. Do not worry, there are some cool diagrams in between which will, uh, which will represent this better. So you have a Python file, and it's a text file. A Python file is a text file. And to, to move it into the, in, into the processor or the Intel i3 or an i5, I mean, there's a, there are a lot of steps involved. And these steps, you could collectively call them as metaprogramming. So what is metaprogramming? So data for traditional programs, when you write, when you write a traditional program, data could be a file. It could be a network packet. You could be doing network programming. You could be reading files. You could be reading HDFS. You could be reading S3. And you could be manipulating stuff. But data for a metaprogram is source code itself. And a source code is just a text file. And you have a program that can read a source code and modify on it based on something. Then it's called a metaprogram. It's as simple as that. So metaprogramming is a very simple concept. And compilers are the biggest metaprograms in the world because they take one language and convert it into another language. And it turns out it's just really useful to think in terms of data structures. And sort of I just wanted to uh, just pause briefly here and thank some of the awesome advances in data structures and things like uh, we can enjoy services like Google Maps and Airbnb, which I really appreciate because I couldn't find a hotel room. and. The nearby search took me to uh, uh, a place in Mannheim, and this this is done because I'm searching somewhere, and it looks for a nearby place. I don't know, when I was in college, this was do, done using some kind of an A-star search. I think Google Maps still uses A-star search uh, for this kind of things. But it's really useful to think in terms of data structures, be it language, concepts, um, anything, right? So even languages are represented in data structures. Our knowledge isn't represented in terms of data structures. The German language can be modeled as a data structure. Computer science is just data structures. I mean, that's, that's all it is. And manipulation on top of data structures. OK, first, the obvious use cases. The boring slides are done. Some, some philosophy talk is done. Let's, let's look at an obvious uh, use case. Can you guess what this code does? And it's not, it's not something trivial. It's actually something kind of cool. I'm, I'm not sure if anyone of you will get it here. But if anyone of you do, I will be pleasantly surprised. Can you guess what this code does? Maybe some shouts from the audience. Factorial? No, not factorial. It's actually quite cryptic, in fact. Let's see how I'm doing on time to see if I can waste more time. No, I cannot waste more time. All right, so let me tell you. It prints the nth Bernoulli number. And I take this example because I also um, uh, like computer history in general. And the nth Bernoulli number was actually the first complex program that anyone ever wrote for any computer. Any guesses on who wrote, the, who wrote this code first? That is correct, on Charles Babbage's analytical engine. And this was the first ever complicated code written the, to generate the nth Bernoulli number. And it's actually a kind of a crazy series. I'm, I don't know if I understand it well to explain it here, but it's pretty cool. But what is wrong with this code? <laughs> and this is going to be something trivial. It's not the logic. It's also going to be something funny. I mean, think about it. This was the first ever code written. And the function name feels a little bit disrespectful, doesn't it, for, for something of a first ever code written. Who writes f of n? Of course, in mathematical terms, f of n means some kind of a representation. But for me, as a software engineer, f of n is just laziness. It's just not acceptable, so it feels a little disrespectful for me. So what do we do about it? Just this, this, is a, this is an actual module that I wrote a couple of weeks back just for the talk, and it is on PyP. 
and you can do a pip install flake it disrespectful code, and you can run it against your code, and it will work, by the way. Uh, let's actually uh, give a quick try about it. And I will increase my, so I wrote a, something the like aha.py, whatever, and it does a def ffx, print x, and then I do a flake 8 here. Uh, I think it needs a flake 8. Ah. And it says, error x9000, stop creating function names with a single character. I expected more from you. <laughs> some, some weird error. But I mean, you could parse the source code for this and check. Uh, so you could write a regex for this and check against def and colon and blah, 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 if the uh, string length is just one or not. But we can do this in a much better way. And the, the idea of this talk is to just quickly how to do that. But the bigger picture, right, so before we get into how we do that, a brief primer on compilers. So a compiler is a really simple thing. It's not a black box at all. There's a front end, there's a middle end, and there's a back end. Almost every compiler today has these three components. The front end is responsible for reading the source code, taking a grammar, and it has parts called lexing and parsing, and et cetera, I mean, a, a few more interesting things. But the main parts are lexing and parsing. And the front end generates some kind of an intermediate representation, which is an abstract syntax tree or a, uh, some kind of another graph, and then that is fed into the middle end of, uh, of the compiler. And the middle end is responsible for optimizations in general. And the middle end, again, generates another intermediate form of representation, usually the context flow graph or a control flow graph, and then gen passes it to the back end. And the back end does really interesting things like code generation and further optimization. And the code generation then, of course, uh, gives you ARM or x86 or MIPS or PowerPC or insert your favorite architecture here code. And in the end, x86 is just pretty much add, mul, sub, move, and blah, blah, blah. So your Scala or your Python or whatever code goes from whatever you write with for i in blah, 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 gets converted with all these steps and gets converted to an ARM or x86 code. And it is not complicated. It's just a, a lot of components uh, scattered around. So let's dive in further. Before we do that, another book, another brief uh, pause. And there, there is this book which I recommend, which is called also the Dragon Book for Compilers. And this is a really, really interesting read. This is one of those classics in computer science, just like uh, uh, SICP or something in, in those leagues. OK, so how does CPython actually work now that you know what compilers do? The design of the CPython compiler is pretty similar to what we saw. It has a front end, middle end, and a back end. And the front end for it is usually the pigeon and the ast.c. One second, how many of you think Python is compiled? How many of you think Python is interpreted? <laughs> that is actually the most stupid question anyone could ask. OK, there are no stupid questions, but a language is not compiled or interpreted. No. You can write a compiler or an interpreter for a language. I could write an interpreter for C. Interpreter and compilers are just metaprograms like we just spoke. So going back to CPython, uh, CPython is actually implemented in C. And CPython is the standard implementation of Python. There is I in Python, Jython, uh, uh, yada, yada, yada. And there's also Cython, but Cython is also a completely different language. It's kind of a superset of a Python. But CPython is the official implementation. If you do, if, if you're using Python, you're using CPython. So C, we, will look at, we will look at the CPython source code. But let me tell you quickly, it has the parser pigeon.c, which reads an example uh, Python file, also takes grammar as an input, two inputs, and generates something called as a parse tree. I think you can follow my arrows here. And the parse tree is then an input to something called as an ast.c. And the ast.c generates the abstract syntax tree, which is then fed into compile.c, which generates a control flow graph, which is fed into compile.c again, which generates the bytecode. And note that this bytecode is not the x86 or the ARM bytecode, but the Python bytecode. And we will see this as well. And the bytecode, once it's generated, is fed into Python C eval.c, which then generates x86 or ARM code. And this is the actual Python uh, process. Now, before, before we get into any further uh, details, let's Uh, look at the Python source code. So I've downloaded the Python source code on my machine. Um, for 
solarized light haters. I'm sorry, this is the only color scheme I use these days. Uh, so this is the CPython source code, which I just uh, did a git pull of. And it has these things. Uh, so what we looked at initially is the parser. And the parser has all of these lines, the parser.c. There's also an AST. Oh, it's not in the parser. Where it's in the Python file. But parser, there's the parser.c here, uh, which uh, parses the grammar and the file. And then there is the, uh, if I go into Python, the core modules are written here. So there is the ASC.C, which file includes functions to transform AST into AS, uh, the concrete syntax tree, which is uh, another intermediate representation into ASD and so on. But the interesting thing that you need to see is the grammar file, which is actually in grammar grammar. But first I will show you the grammar file, and it will look complicated to you, and then we will do some exercise, and it won't look so complicated anymore. Uh, so, so actually, there's, there's some code like the statement, give simple statement, and compound statement, and so on. But let's understand what a grammar is first. So a grammar, like any language, like Deutsch or English, is can be formally defined. And grammars for computer languages are also formally defined. So let's define a formally, uh, let's formally define a grammar. So let's say that there is some kind of a start string called S. Can you follow my arrows? Like, is that comfortable? Perfect. So let's say there is uh, uh, a start symbol called S, which gives something called an AB. And let's say that this A here gives AA or epsilon. Just follow, follow me here. AA or epsilon. Epsilon means the stop string or the null string. And then this B here gives a small b or a small b or a b recursively. It gives itself. And the same here. This capital A gives either a small a or a big A, which is itself. So now the exercise that we are going to do is does this string or does this line, does this word here belong to this grammar or not? So we parse it. Right? So first we take the start symbol S. This is the way we parse. We take the start symbol S, and then we say, okay, we know that S gives AB, so AB. We write it down. And then we know that A gives AA, so we take this A here, and then we make it give AA, and replace it with this AA here. So far, so good. Yeah. And then we take this A here, and then make it give AA again, because we know that A gives A capital A. And then we take this A here, you know where this is going, and AA here, right? And then finally we take this A here, and then we say it gives epsilon, and we just discard it, and then we finally take this B here, and it gives B. And then, do you not agree that this word is the same as this? So how many of you know what we just did? OK, we parsed. But do you know what grammar did we parsed? The Python grammar, of course. But we parsed something called as an LL1 of grammar. And now you have bragging rights to go tell your colleagues that I know LL1 of grammar. And this is actually unnecessarily complicated in, in a lot of textbooks, but it is really simple. So what LL1 of grammar means is take, take the leftmost symbol, do a left to right derivation, one at a time. And that's what we did. We took the leftmost derivation, we parsed it left to right, one at a time. So that is LL1 of grammar. There are also other grammars like LR1, LL2, LLK, whatever. And all of these come under something called as a context-free grammar. And most of the computer languages today we know is a co context-free grammar. And then you would also start uh, f f playing around with Turing machines and whatever next. But we, we looked at grammar, grammar. Let's, OK, so now, now that you know what a grammar means, uh, let's go back to the grammar file. So now you know statement give simple statement or compound statement. Suddenly it's making a lot more sense now, isn't it? It's just like S gives A or B. Statement gives simple statement or compound statement. 
An internally simple statement gives a small statement or a new line. A small statement gives an expression, a delete, a pass, a flow, an import, and so on. So the entire Python grammar is an LL1 of grammar written in 150 lines, and it's that simple. Now that you know how grammar works, you can, and you can look for things like this and start replacing them with whatever you like. It's that simple. And, and that's how Einfuren uh, sys worked. We replaced the import with Einfuren and built the CPython compiler. Uh, sorry for a, any bad pronunciation. Um, all right, so we hacked the grammar. Now let's hack the bytecode before hacking the ASD. So this is hacking, by the way. Take the entire black box, break it down into pieces, hack at every level. Be, be ruthless when you're hacking. So take the bytecode, and let's, let's do some experiments with bytecode again. I will uh, maybe take a different uh, shell and do a Jupyter console. Um, then do maybe define some 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 function, and now you could access. Okay, first there is also this. Let's look at this. Let's look at the human readable format of this bytecode. Uh, so there is this module called this. I'm sure most of you know this. And you can look at the bytecode of this function, this particular function. So the bytecode of square is load fast, load fast, that it loads x twice, does a binary multiply, and then it runs a value. So this is the bytecode. What you didn't know, or I think you might know, but less known, is also this is accessible via underscore underscore code. So this is a code object of that function. Now you can start looking at, the code option also gives you a series of nice, nice things. So you can look at, uh, you can look at actual, the actual bytecode in its hexadecimal, all its hexadecimal glory with core underscore code. And then you can, I don't know, you can, it has, you can just do a dir on it and see what all objects are available. So this particular core n locals object uh, gives you the number of arguments that a function accepts. So you can actually check how many arguments that square accepts, and it accepts one argument. And you can already start doing interesting things with this, like just uh, prohibit people from calling functions with a single argument or something like that. Uh, yeah. So um, OK, so quickly moving on from bytecode hacking. And, and you can do quite, quite a lot more with bytecode hacking, by the way. But let's get to the interesting part. We looked at this. Now the AST, the center data representation of, of, of this whole compilation process. And now we will look at the, uh, I'll go back to this console of mine, and then um, I will clear this up. Oops, OK. And uh, I will import this module called AST, and also this module called AST unparsed, which will no, okay, maybe I need to activate my uh, I hope this works. So it's just so you know, this is not completely scripted. Errors have to happen. Uh, da, 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 import AST, import AST and parse. Yeah, so AST and parse is not available in the standard library, but AST is. So I, I import AST and AST parse. Uh, why am I typing it again? I'm not sure. Uh, so I will start defining a source code. Let's say x is equal to 73 or something. Uh, interesting question. How many, do, you, do you know that the number 73 is actually special? I did the same. I, I do this bit in all of my talks. I throw around an interesting number, ask the audience what the interesting number is. So. This is me doing the interesting number bit of my talk. Anyone knows what 73? Anyone know why the 73 is uh, interesting? It's the typical human random number. It's typical human random number. Okay. It is. It is a prime. That is true. That is also true. So it's an MRP or a prime reverse. 73 is a prime. 37 is also a prime, but it doesn't end there. 
73 is the 21st prime number, 37 is the 12th prime number, 21, 1, 2, and 21 is 7 into 3. So it, it goes on, it's a rabbit hole. The number 73 is a, it's just a rabbit hole. All right, uh, we've done some nice things. So I define source code equal to x is equal to 73. And all of you agree that this is a valid Python code, right? x equal to 73. Of course, it is a valid Python code. I won't wait for your agreement on this. Um, so, so I don't know. I will uh, do something called ast.parse. And it will give me a tree object. So I will, this, this is my tree object. I can, I can start doing things like this. Tree is equal to ast.parse. And then uh, just to ensure that it is the actual thing I need, I will do an unparse and print it out. And it is x equal to 73. So, so far, so good. We have parsed the tree and we have unparsed the tree. And now we will start accessing elements inside the tree. It is a tree and we're all coders, so we know how to manipulate trees. And I, there is a function called ast.dump of tree, which gives me the elements of the tree. Uh, I, I know that uh, this doesn't exactly look like a tree, but it is a tree. Just imagine the module being the root, the body, and, 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 and its leaves uh, as a, the code as a tree. And now that I know that this is the structure of the tree, I can start accessing elements of the tree. So tree.body, because body is the member of this tree module. So this, this is a list. So I will do a list with one element. So I will do tree.body of zero. It will give me the ASD assign. And maybe I will now look at the targets, because targets is the member of this um, tree.body targets. And since this is a list as well, I will go to the zeroth one. And now we get a name. And the name object here, I'm just reading this off of here. This is actually really good Python. I'm just, I know these are properties and members of this module, uh, attributes of this uh, objects. And then I, this is normal Python, by the way. And then I access the ID. We've traversed down, we've actually done something really cool here. We've traversed down the tree and gotten to the variable. And now what is stopping me from doing this? Nothing. I can do that. And now, if I do asd unparse dot unparse of tree, of course, it gives some new lines. But we have essentially modified the source code from x is equal to 73 to y equals 73. We have. And this is just one line of code. Imagine doing this with a for loop on a really big project, <laughs> replacing all the variables with something that you want. <laughs> The true spirit of hacking. All right. But I will not give you any further ideas. I know all of you are really smart. Um, but what I will tell, and I think I have just, uh, around five to 10 minutes remaining in my talk. But what I will tell is how I did the Flake 8 plugin. So AST, the AST module gives you um, a class called Node Visitor, which you can overload. Uh, I did that somewhere here, All right? So I'm just going to show it to you. I'm not going to live code, and I I know that you guys trust me that I can code really nice. So I will just show you. Oh, let me. All right. So I wrote this uh, code called AST Node Visitor .py, and I'm going to just explain this here. Um, so I've imported AST, right? And then I've written a class called funk visitor, which visits all the functions. Let's, let's just, uh, for a minute before I'll come to that, let's just do one more ASC.parse so you'll get a better feeling of this. I will empower you more with uh, hacking today. Uh, all right, tree is equal to, oh, let me go back up. So tree is equal to ASC.parse, um, I don't know, def. Uh, foo or def random and return an absolutely random number. And uh, ta -ta -da, what I will do now is ast.dump of tree. Okay, so just to show you, there are other uh, uh, objects in the module node as well. We saw an ID, mod I ID attribute, now ID class, and now we see other classes of ASD. There's a function def. There's the other obvious things, but the function def was the most important one which I wanted to tell you about. 
And every, every Python uh, element that you saw in the grammar file is represented as an AST module. So we can use that knowledge and hack into func all function definitions only. And when you overload, when you inherit a func visitor, ast.node visitor, it, and, and define this function called def visit underscore function def, and pass a node to it, or a tree to it. So all I'm doing is tree is equal to ast.parse, open some dummy func.py, read that, parse it to the uh, func visitor, and then there'll be an, uh, so this function will visit all the nodes of this file, which are function definitions. And then if, of course, we get to that part, that, that childish part. So if the length, node name dot length equal to equal to one, you, you can print, I expected more from you. You could, you could do anything with this, really. Something like your functions should start with Z, or your functions should only be three characters, or your function should accept five variables, or you can really limit product, or devel uh, pro product developer productivity with this kind of stuff. Um, uh, and, and that's what, that, I think that's what Pepe does. No, 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 Pepe doesn't do that. Um, so you, you can do things like this. You can build IDEs, custom IDEs. You could build DSLs and parse languages like this. Um, yeah, you can, uh, you can do really cool things. There's also um, another class called AST Node Transformer. Uh, which also I've written. Uh, let me clear that. P L S. Yeah, P S. Just. Uh, yeah. So this, this, this is more, much more interesting. So what this does is it rewrite names. So it uh, loads something called as a dummy dot py. Let's actually run this example. Uh, okay. So. This dummy dot pi is x equal to this is x, y equal to this is y, print x and print y. When I uh, now run est node transformer dot pi, it actually converts everything into, it even converts the print into a data lookup. Of course, I didn't put much effort into this, but you could just do an if condition and avoid print statements being uh, this. So you could essentially turn all the variables into something like a dictionary lookup or some some evil thing like that, uh, with with you could, you could inject your custom dictionary into the Python runtime and modify this so whenever there's a variable, it would actually refer to your dictionary variable um, or some madness. So uh, all all that is it is doing is it copies an AST location and this is just some Python's AST logic. And it returns a different ast.name and the ast.index. And, and that's about that, uh, really. So we can write Flake 8 plugins with this. And you could also push it to, you could do stupid things and push it to PyPE. And that's the actual link. You could look at the source code, actually. It's quite interesting. Um, and yeah, um, all you have to do is just solemnly swear that you're up to no good. Thank you. I'm actually not sure. I have yeah, never I, seen I, that. I'm also unsure because ah, okay. I'm not in the mechanics yet. Oh, ah, cool. But it's very interesting because you can do DSLs on a pair of file databases. Mm, that they is very that, cool. Uh, to do a query language based on this combination. Yeah, if you've used Ruby's active records, I think it works something like that. Yeah, I think it's related yeah. to that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 yet another uh, uh, step yeah. before your uh, yeah. system change. Yeah. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. Good. Another question over there. Yeah. And this, uh, in the bytecode, you don't have the AST anymore. So if you've got type E files, that won't work. So at yeah. some point, would I have to uh, inject my code if I wanted to then pass my whatever? So your German. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah um that would be a little difficult to do yeah it so you would need to decompile it in some way because when you build the python it takes the grammar file and hooks that into the parser so i'm not sure how we could uh, take a build uh, or a PyC module and uh, redo this. I'm not sure about that. I don't think you could. You can actually do it with that way. You can? Like with the ah, OK, I'm not the expert here. Yeah. Yes, so, so you just add another graph node, you decompile, and then you do the whole thing again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, thank you.